on <laughs> looking at the law because my knowledge is limited and honestly the more i look into the law the less and less i feel like i know and it's true with most things of the most high the more you know the less you know and y'all has shown that to me many times but i'm continuing to seek and so much of this was new to me i never really thought about the numbering of the law being different for religious institutions i honestly assumed it was the same for everybody until i looked it up and i was like oh wow there's some discrepancies here so what is truth and another thing i never considered until i really started delving into the law which has only led to more questions but <laughs> it's what did the tablets actually look like so when we think of the tablets right the, the tablets that were inscribed by the Most High, Moses coming down on the mount, right? We think of these stone, gray stone um, tablets with the curved corners, right? We've seen this in many pictures. We've seen this in different uh, biblical depictions by Hollywood. This is the image that is portrayed to us. When you first think of the tablets, I'm sure I'm not the only one. This is the image that pops into your mind. But what if I told you that the tablets could possibly have looked more like this? Blue. The color of sapphire. Actually carved out from a sapphire stone. And then engraved with these, with this writing. And I'm talking about the first set of the tablets, by the way. Because remember, Moses came down with the first set of tablets, saw Israel given unto their idol worship, right? They made the golden calf, and Moses, in his fury, smashes the first set and then goes back up again to receive a second set of the commandments. So, the first set may possibly have been carved from sapphire. But let's take a look at what this says so when you just google sapphire 10 commandments right to see if this is the truth the first thing that comes up is this little excerpt here so we'll read that and then we'll go to the wikipedia article just to get a general idea of the information that's out there concerning the 10 commandments and their possibility of being carved out of sapphire but let's read it says the ancient persians believed that the earth rested on a giant sapphire and that its reflection gave the sky its color blue jewish tradition holds that moses was given the ten commandments on tablets of sapphire making it the most sacred of gemstones hmm. very interesting and then when you look at this um wikipedia article on the tablets of stone um let's see here that i don't even really think we need to read this so much as take note of this one thing because it's like okay so this is an interesting statement but like where are they getting this information from because it doesn't say in scripture there's nowhere in scripture where it says that the tablets were made of sapphire it just simply says stone but it doesn't specify what kind at least that i can find if i'm wrong somebody please present this information but the question is like where are where is the jewish tradition getting this understanding of the tablets as sapphire and so we'll just take a look at this paragraph here to answer that question according to the traditional teachings of judaism in the talmud they were made of blue sapphire stone as a symbolic reminder of the sky the heavens and ultimately of god's throne Many Torah scholars, however, append the biblical sapir was, in fact, lapis lazuli. Lapis lazuli is a possible alternate rendering of sapphire, the stone pavement under God's feet, when the intention to craft the tablets of the covenant is disclosed. Okay, so we'll get into that in a second. But So they're getting this from the Jewish Talmud. So what is the Talmud, right? The Talmud is the central text of rabbinic Judaism and the primary source of Jewish religious law. So they're basing this tradition and this understanding of the tablets of sapphire based on this Talmud, this book written by rabbis. 
and they claim that it was sapphire to represent the sky, the heavens, and also God's throne. And we'll get into that scripture in a moment. So going back to looking at these images here, based on scripture, I could not find anything that proves that the tablets were carved out of sapphire stone. As I stated previously, all I could find was that they're carved out of stone without specifying what kind. And when you look it up on Google, they might tell you that the tablets are made out of sapphire, but they're basing that off of this Jewish tradition based on the Talmud. So I cannot say for a fact that the tablets were sapphire blue. But this is what I do know based on scripture, is that this color blue does have a correlation with the law. So, reading Numbers chapter 15, verses 38 through 41, it reads, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments, and throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe, that ye may look upon it, and remember all the commandments of Yahuwah and do them. So the blue fringes that they're instructed to put on the borders of their garments were blue in order to remind them when they looked at the blue fringes to remind them of the commandments of God and to take action and do them. Continuing on. And that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you used to go a whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments, and be holy unto your Yah. I am Yahuwah your Yah, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your Yah. I am Yahuwah your Yah. So it's not just, the blue fringes are not just for us to remind, to remember the commandments of Yah and to do them, but so that we don't go a whoring. What is a whoring? That is the second commandment, and also the first. That you shall not go after strange gods, and that you shall not worship any graven images, because now you are not being faithful to the Most High, your Creator, your Yahuwah, and your Yah. Now you are going a whoring to other, yeah, to other gods, to other deities, or even just false deities and physical objects or people. Now you are not being faithful. Now you have gone astray from your husband, because as a congregation. We are the wife, and Hamashiach is our husband. The blue tassels were meant to remind us of the law, and as we understood from the first video, the law is the eternal word, and who is the word? Hamashiach. So, the blue tassels. Jesus dressed like a rabbi, blue tassels on the four corners of your garments, right? So this was an instruction. We just read from Numbers chapter 30. Um, well, we didn't read verse 37, but we did read 38 through 41. This instruction for the, the priests of Israel, really, or a teacher or a... Um, priest of the most high right because this instruction for from numbers and deuteronomy is instructions for the priests those who are going to be ministering in the temple of the most high and so they were instructed to put these blue fringes on the corner of their garment and remember the meaning was to remind them of the law but also when if you can remember from the gospels um, specifically Matthew, but this is also touched on in the other Gospels. The woman who was suffering from a hemorrhage touched the tassels of his cloak. And she was suffering from this hemorrhage. She was bleeding for like 18 years or something crazy like that. And when she touched the tassels of his cloak, she was healed. Matthew chapter 9 verse 20. 
If you want to read more of that story and get a little bit more detail, refer to Matthew chapter 9. But regardless, going back to the sapphire, so we know that the blue was meant to remind you of the law. That's why they were commanded, the priests were commanded to wear four blue fringes on the corner of their garments. But that's not the only place in scripture where we see this blue um, correlated with the most high as importance. The other place in scripture where we see sapphire, which is a color, a certain, a particular um, spectrum of blue, is in the throne, the descriptions of the throne of Yah in visions. So reading from Exodus chapter 24 verses 19 or excuse me verse 9 through 12 and then up went and it reads then went up Moses and Aaron Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and they saw the Yah of Israel and there was under his feet as it were a paved work of a sapphire stone and as it were the body of heaven in his clearness so under his feet was a paved work of sapphire stone so all this under his feet is sapphire here but continuing on and upon the nobles of the children of israel he laid not his hand also they saw yah and did eat and drink and Yahuwah said unto Moses, Come up to me in the, into the mount, and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone, and a law, and commandments which I have written, which I have written, okay, that thou mayest teach them. These are the commandments which the Most High had written. And when he instructs Moses to come up there, all he says is that I'm going to give you these tables of stone. It doesn't necessarily say sapphire stone. But it does say that he had sapphire stone under his feet. Now, looking at Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, we also get a very similar description of the throne of the Most High. And this is coming from a totally different prophet, from a totally different period in history. Now we're getting close to um, the Babylonian captivity. So, it reads... And above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne, as the appearance of a sapphire stone. And upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man upon it. And I saw the color of amber as the appearance of fire round about within it. From the appearance of his loins even upward, and from the appearance of his loins even downward, I saw, as it were, the appearance of fire, and it had brightness round about. Woo! Hallelujah. It is a mighty and awesome thing to be able to see the throne of Yah. I mean, just looking at this description is heavy. I mean, in his purity, he just blazes with fire and just the rainbow around him. And uh, it just seems so beautiful and so mighty and majestic. But once again, we see here the appearance of sapphire stone correlated with the throne of the Most High. It continues, as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain, so was the appearance of the brightness round about. This was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of Yahuwah. And when I saw it, I fell upon my face, and I heard a voice of one that spake. And then sticking to the book of Ezekiel, but jumping now to chapter 10, verse 1, when he sees another vision by the Most High, um, is another similar description, right? Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. So his throne is made of sapphire, and under his feet is the sapphire stone. And then the cherubims, or cherubims, cherubims are, if I can go back here, the four angels that remain before the throne of Yah. So these are very holy, high angels. 
and they're depicted differently in both of these and i'm not getting into that today but that's what they are in case you did not know and then also looking at revelation chapter 21 verses 19 through 20 we see another uh account of sapphire and scripture but this is actually not describing the throne of the most high but describing the foundations of the new jerusalem so when yah returns and restores heaven and earth and brings down his kingdom from heaven the new jerusalem to earth where we will reign and live in eternity with him Sapphire is mentioned as one of the foundations, which is just interesting. So it reads, And the foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth Emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Sardis, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysoprasus, I don't even know what that is, <laughs> and the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. Sorry, that was difficult to pronounce. <laughs> but, like I, but, yes. So as you can see, sapphire is included in one of these foundations, and mm, this city is about to be beautiful. If just the foundations are built out of these gorgeous precious stones i mean woo, this city is about to be beautiful y'all this new jerusalem is about to be the greatest city ever so not only does blue have a correlation with the fringes to remind us of the law as well as sapphire having a huge con connection to the throne of the most high and also the new kingdom to come where the throne of the most high will remain but also blue has more correlation to the clothes of the high priest and also the um the colors of the temple so the colors of the clothes priest and also the colors of the tabernacle and the temple that moses was instructed to er to erect by the most high um blue is within that so we see blue is not only i mean well as you can see these are two different pictures but there's blue intermixed with this entire piece of clothing and blue is supposed to be the robe underneath and then it also has this interwoven piece here that is supposed to be scarlet blue purple and gold so the priest clothing as you can see has all that the scarlet, the blue, the purple, and the gold. In this depiction, they only gave him the blue and the white, so that's why I had to get this one too. Um, because we need that scarlet, blue, and gold. So let's read Exodus chapter 28, verses 3 to 8, in order to see in scripture for ourselves what colors the priests were instructed to wear. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise hearted whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And these are the garments which they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, and a robe, and a broidered coat, a mitre, and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And they shall take gold, and blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine linen. So keep this in mind, this gold, this blue, this purple, and scarlet for the priest's uniform. It continues. And they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, and of purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen with cunning work. It shall have the two shoulder pieces thereof joined at the two edges thereof, and so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod which is upon it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, and purple, and scarlet, and fine twined linen. 
So we see the blue in the priest garments. And they would also have the blue fringes. Blue is also necessary and instructed to be present in the veils of the temple. So looking at the pattern of the tabernacle which was given to Moses, this pattern of the tabernacle is what was used um, later on to create the temple. But this is a pattern of the tabernacle. And they had, it, according to the, this tabernacle pattern, there were veils, right, that separated the, um, the court roundabout from the holy place, as well as another veil between the holy place and the most holy place. And this might be an easier description to understand. So outside of the tent is the court roundabout. And then once you enter the tent, you enter into the holy place. And once you enter the second veil, that is when you get to the holy of holies or the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant resides. But look at these curtains here. In the temple, there had to be present blue, purple, scarlet and gold the curtains are blue purple and scarlet and the items within the tabernacle are gold so reading this from scripture we have exodus chapter 26 verses 32 33 and thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount and thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twined linen of cunning work with cherubims shall it be made so the cherubims had to be present on it too but these colors should sound familiar right because we just read them we just read that they were also used to fashion the garments of the high priest it continues on and thou shalt hang it up upon four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver and thou shalt hang up the veil under the tatches that thou mayest bring it thither within the veil the ark of the testimony and the veil shall divide unto you between the holy place and the most holy so as you can see we've got the gold and this the gold fashions that are hanging it, it up and then we have the blue the purple and scarlet actually comprising the veil itself so these four colors have significance because not only are they used for the colors of the high priest but according to the tabernacle pattern of the most high which we know has relevance in the way everything was fashioned because all goes after this blueprint of the tabernacle pattern that's how y'all created life so gold has this and each color has a specific meaning so just looking at a, a surface level understanding of the, the meaning of these colors gold generally has a correlation with purity and riches which is why yah tends to wear a gold crown and has gold associated with his throne and with his tabernacle and then it also has to do with riches right um gold being a luxurious um item a worthy item now blue as we saw has a correlation with the law or the word or the living waters right the, the color of the sky the color of the water the sapphire throne of the word <laughs> Right, how much she sitting on that throne, the living word. And then we have purple. Purple has a connotation with royalty. It's a symbol of royalty. And then scarlet or red has to do with blood or sacrifice. So each one of these um colors has a significance for the tabernacle and also has a significance with the with um hamashiach and his pattern of salvation right he is the blood sacrifice he is the king of kings he is the living water he is the living word he is the living law and he's also 
the most pure hearted. He is righteous for a reason because he was tried in the fire of the flesh and came out pure. And he is rich, rich in glory and honor and majesty and strength and power and wisdom. Anything you can think of, he's rich in it, being the creator of all things. So, um, yeah, and being one with the Father. Now that we have a basic understanding of the significance of these colors and scriptures, um, and also the symbolism, the symbolism of these colors, we're going to be taking a look at a snippet from Revelation chapter 17. And this snippet from Revelation chapter 17 is describing <clears throat> Mystery Babylon. And Mr. Mystery Babylon is the culmination of the wicked powers on this earth, basically. It is the representation of the different <clears throat> empires and kingdoms that have been established on this earth in corruption, in violence, in governmental robbery of the people these are the beast systems that are described in daniel the four beast system and the fourth beast culminates with mystery babylon mystery babylon is the spirit that has been laid upon every ancient empire since Babylon time, which is called Mystery Babylon. It's a spirit. But let us read. Then came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the condemnation of the great harlot who sits upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed adultery. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her adultery. So pausing here for a moment. This great harlot who sits upon many waters, right? This is beginning the description of Mystery Babylon. Many waters is symbolic of the nations. A sea of people is many waters. So this is referring to nations. This is referring to peoples who sits upon many nations, who has power and dominion over many people. And remember, when we first read in Numbers the description about the blue tassels, and that the blue tassels were supposed to remind us of the law, so that we do not go a whoring or commit adultery with the spirits of darkness by making us worship other deities besides the one true living God. So when they're describing this great harlot, they're using this as a symbol of the turning away from, from the Most High to the point where you are now exalting darkness and, and reveling in the evil ways to the point that you are proud of them and you want to satisfy the lust of your flesh rather than seek the spirit of the most high so that is the adultery that we can all commit and who this great harlot has by the ways of this mystery babylon nation it has caused other kingdoms and rulers of those kingdoms to commit adultery with this harlot or to follow after her ways um and same with the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her adultery. We have drunk the wine of Babylon and drunk the ways of Babylon and the understanding of Babylon. And we are so caught up in the matrix of this system that we live in today. We're almost drunk with this reality. When the physical reality is only partly what's going on. The perception of a physical realm is, does not show you everything. Continuing on, though, with verse 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet wild beast, inscribed with many words of blasphemy, and having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet, 
and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls. And she had a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of adultery on earth. And upon her forehead was a name written that not all could understand. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyr of Yeshua. And when I saw her, I wondered with great amazement. So to get a little bit deeper understanding of some of these things, the beast with seven heads and ten horns, which she sits upon and other things, you can continue reading the chapter um 17 of revelation on your own and it the angel who is with john um the uh will um kind of tell him a little bit about what he's seeing so give you a little bit more meaning as to these things because it's a vision in the spirit that he's experiencing and then also relaying to us throughout the book of revelation But what we want to note from these verses is the colors that this woman is wearing. Mystery Babylon, the mother of the abominations of the earth. Right? This is a culmination of all wickedness and all wicked empires that have established themselves on Yah's righteous earth. Fruitful earth, bountiful earth, beautiful earth, and have corrupted it and have destroyed and pillaged it to the point where we are at today. But she's wearing purple, meaning she has decked herself. She has taken the crown upon her own head and called herself queen. She was not adorned with that position. She was not granted that position. She usurped it. She took it. She took the purple of the royalty. The scarlet. She's arrayed in scarlet. And we see already in the in verse 6, she's drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of all the prophets, the blood of all our people that has been spilt throughout history. The blood of the innocent is on her hands and upon her lips. The scarlet. Mystery Babylon has killed many. Who has killed more than Mystery Babylon? Her insatiable thirst for blood. And she's also adorned with gold and the precious stones and pearls, meaning she's rich, wealthy. She has plundered the point, the earth to the point that she has gathered all of its rich riches and all of its precious things unto herself with the greed of Mystery Babylon, the greed of these current world leaders and nations. But what are we missing, right? So she's got the purple, the scarlet, the gold. But what does she not have? Blue. She wants the riches. She wants the throne. And she wants to see the blood of the righteous spilt. But does she want to submit to the living waters? Does she want to be condemned by the righteous, eternal law of the Most High? No. Nor will she affiliate herself with the law. For everything she does is the antonym of the law. The law being the light and she being the darkness. Now, this is important to note because in the next video, we'll be taking a look at different current church institutions and the colors that they decide to include within their congregation and the certain symbols attached to these colors. And we'll be comparing that to these four significant colors that we see throughout the entire Bible that were given unto Moses as the blueprint for the temple and the tabernacle and comparing that to the way other congregations have manipulated this and taken the things that they want, cherry-picked the things they liked, and threw out the rest, which we cannot do. It's all or nothing. We must accept all of this as truth and be able to submit unto it or cast it all aside. Because if we are lukewarm, we will be spit out of the mouth of the Most High. Give all praise and glory to the Most High, Sistren. Give all praise and glory unto the Creator and the Author of the Living Law. The Creator and Author of all life. Hallelujah.
and peace be with you.